Pakistan Air Force is very keen to acquire eight F 16s. These are Block 52s from the United States of America. And this process has been on for about a year. What is this requirement? Is it likely to meet our force goals? To discuss this, we are honored to have in the studio today two veteran F 16 pilots and veteran Air Force officers who know the subject very well. They need no introduction, but still, first things first, we have with us Air Marshal Shahid Lati, former Vice Chief of the Air Staff, and one of the pioneering pilots of the F 16s. Welcome to the show. We have with us Air Marshal Yusuf Chaudhary, former Deputy Chief of uh, Air Staff, and again, a veteran F 16 pilot. Welcome. So, Air Marshal Shahid Latif, what is uh, the requirement of Pakistan Air Force? Why are we so keen on these eight, eight F 16s joining our fleet? Well, first of all, uh, uh, going back into history, uh, we must tell our viewers that uh, it's been since uh, 1981 that Pakistan has been operating F-16s. So it's been almost 35 years. And uh, it is not uh, a requirement that was raised one year ago uh, that we need more F-16s. Uh, I would once again draw your attention to the time when the contract for F-16s, Cs and Ds was signed. Mm -hmm. And this was back in 2008, almost seven to eight years ago. And uh, I was the one who was in the chair at that time, and uh, I led the delegation uh, to uh, discuss this whole contract. And along with this contract, there were many other things that we achieved. For example, the upgrade of our old F-16s, uh, which is called the MLU. The uh, midlife update. The midlife upgrade. Uh, similarly, uh, there were uh, at least, uh, there were actually 28 F-16s that had not been provided to Pakistan in spite of the fact that we had paid uh, 650 millions in advance. And uh, so through this contract, we were able to bargain and ask them that you must give us the F-16s that, that you uh, did not provide at that time. Uh, half of them had been uh, given to the U.S. Air Force and the other to the U.S. Navy. Uh, unfortunately, the ones that were with U.S. Navy 14 mm -hmm. uh, were not given to us because they had been modified uh, as per the U.S. requirement and somehow it was said that the demodification was difficult. However, we were able to get at least 14 of them. Okay. So uh, I think it was a good deal that we signed uh, back in 2008 uh, as a result of which we got eight new F-16s and the rest of our fleet, the A's and B's uh, were upgraded uh, through MLU. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, at that time, because all of this money had to be paid through the national funds, mm -hmm. 36 uh, F-16s. So uh, we were not able to uh, cough out uh, so much uh, at that time. And therefore, we uh, only bought 18. So the remaining 18 were due. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could raise uh, that requirement any time. And now it was felt uh, by the Air Force that out of the 18 remaining F-16s, uh, we should go for eight more F-16s and uh, principally speaking the approval for uh, 36 F-16s was granted at that time. Mm -hmm. So this is not a new deal okay. uh, uh, which is what India is trying to portray. Uh, we'll it is not a new deal. We will come to India in a little while. Okay. Uh, for mm -hmm. that matter, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we must understand that this is mm -hmm. not a new deal. Obviously. And uh, part of the uh, same deal and the aircraft that were remaining. Uh, we did not buy them due to shortage of funds. So if we go in for this deal, it is very much legitimate, very much our right uh, to ask for those F-16s. The only issue at this point in time would be that I think we should endeavor, and that is what uh, the Air Force is trying to uh, achieve, that uh, most of this uh, must be paid through FMF, which is the Foreign Military Funds by USA. If you recall, uh, when there was this Afghan war and the first batch of F-16s and the deal that was struck at that time, most of the F-16s and the equipment actually was part of the FMS uh, because the U.S. was in need mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of uh, Pakistan Air Force uh, supporting them uh, in Afghanistan. And I guess uh, it is more or less the same situation today. In this case, I guess uh, the Congress has been notified. A 30 uh, days period has already started. In fact, a week has gone by. 
and uh, my understanding is that uh, this is through a, a FMF, uh, foreign military financing, out of which 50% will be paid by the US and 50% by Pakistan, but in a spread over three years. I guess uh, this is yet to be uh, finally decided uh, as per the information that I have, mm -hmm. uh, Pakistan is trying uh, that most of it uh, should be funded uh, through FMF. Right. Um, uh, the, the overall uh, price has come up uh, to be about $650 million. And I guess we are trying to put in about 200 and the remaining 450 is, is being asked uh, from the U.S. side. Right. So, so like I said, this has not been finalized, but this is the initial information. that Exactly. And I'm sure the endeavor must be that there is a minimum burden on the national sure. exchequer. Sure. Sure. So, uh, M. Ashil Yusuf Chaudhary, you also, among other things, been the chief project director of Project Falcon, which is the project for the F-16s. What is your uh, personal view about the acquisition of these F-16s? I think first of all, as already said by Marshal Shahid, uh, that it must be understood that it was already uh, signed uh, uh, for agreement with the United States of America for 36 aircraft. It was only due to earthquake of 2005 when we decided that okay, money is probably more needed for the rehabilitation of the people who are affected by that earthquake. So instead of 36, let's buy 18 only. And then whenever we have the money, we will buy the remaining 18. Because a fleet of 18 is really not a viable option for any Air Force. So that is one. Secondly, we must understand that America has always given us bare minimum capability that to only when it was needed to achieve a common objective, if at all, for Pakistan and America both. In the same context, today we realize that success of maybe SWAT operation or Zarbe Az was largely dependent upon the uh, role which F-16 has played. It was F-16 because of which we have been able to dismantle command and control uh, of Taliban, their hideouts, and some of their ammo dumps. So therefore, so we, therefore we have been very extensively utilizing the SACOF for counter-insurgency and counter-terrorism campaign. So that's why America has agreed to give us eight more, although we should have asked for 18. And as per my knowledge, they are uh, contributing 60% and 40 we have to pay. And uh, so this is uh, need of the hour. This is even if you see uh, the notification which has been sent to the Congress, it very clearly uh, spells out three things. Number one, it will not alter the prevalent uh, military balance in the region. I don't know why India is making so much of noise. It very clearly says so. Then he says it will help in achieving our foreign policy objectives and national security aims. So that means it is the interest of America the United as States. well. Third, he says it will enhance the capability of Pakistan Air Force uh, in conduct of uh, anti-terrorism and anti-insurgency operations. So yeah, I they made it very really clear. For us. So, Air Marshal Shai, the, um, you brought up the subject of India, and Air Marshal Yusuf has also touched upon it. What is the halabulu? I mean, why is India raising a human cry for just eight F-16s? I think this is typical of the Indian mentality. Uh, Any time Pakistan goes for any legitimate need uh, for it to uh, defend its territory. Uh, you always hear India uh, indulging in propaganda and lobbying all over the world uh, as if uh, a small addition uh, to our military force will alter uh, the balance of power in the region. <laughs> uh, that has never been the case. For instance, you know, their, uh, for example, defense budget is almost seven times uh, that of Pakistan. Even the Americans have said it uh, very clearly this time that they are the biggest buyers of defense equipment. Uh, they are talking about India. In fact, uh, SIPRI, the Stockholm uh, uh, Institute of, uh, uh, they have uh, Stockholm uh, International Peace, Peace. Study yes. uh, Institute. They have given a report in 2014. They said India had 7% of the global armament import uh, percentage. Now it has risen to 14%. And it has already overshot China in 2010 being the largest importer of arms from abroad. Indeed. So they're the and they're the biggest, biggest buyers, buyers, like I said. So the, biggest buyers the matter is very clear. 
And then you see, uh, they have uh, opted for 126 Rafales, and we have not raised uh, even a word what to say, hue and cry. You see, they are the people who have al always indulged in, um, in aggression, not only against Pakistan, but all the uh, small neighbors around India have suffered from Indian hegemonic designs. Uh, look what they are doing with Nepal, what they had done with Sri Lanka by sponsoring terrorism in that country. And somehow they, uh, they have a mindset that they should also suppress Pakistan to the extent that, they, that Pakistan accepts the treatment that other small countries uh, around India do. Uh, that's never going to happen. Pakistan is a nuclear power. Uh, our forces, by the grace of Almighty, uh, are renowned and they have a name in the whole world. So the Indian designs uh, to prevail upon Pakistan uh, will never succeed. However, uh, feeling frustrated on that account, uh, they start lobbying, they indulge in propaganda, they mislead people, they create negative perceptions. Uh, the matter is very clear and the Americans have said it, I think they have taken a very strong stance in saying that uh, they have uh, obviously rejected uh, the Indian stance by saying that no, it will not alter uh, any balance of power in the subcontinent and two, uh, they have verified and supported uh, the uh, Pakistani stance in which we say that uh, we have used uh, this weapon system against terrorism and terrorism has affected uh, the whole world. So the objectives are common and if the Americans are helping you, they are helping themselves and they have said so that uh, the overall uh, safety uh, of, of the world and particularly that of America is dependent. Uh, on the help that we are extending to Pakistan. So I think they have given a very clear reply. Indian I don't think the Indian propaganda this time is, uh, going, to work. Uh, is going to work. Exactly. And uh, if you recall, uh, Marshal Yusuf, uh, yesterday the spokesperson for the Pentagon used the term, and I quote, uh, uh, India is trying to make a mountain out of a molehill by criticizing uh, the acquisition of just eight F-16s by Pakistan. Yes, I... Uh, agree. What I uh, would like to highlight is that it is not something new they are doing. Uh, if you recall when we got 40 of 16s and uh, that was the time they made similar hue and cry. And, uh, but Pakistan approach has been very mature at, uh, because I remember uh, immediately after we got 40 of 16s and some people may not know that we had limited capability was given to us even then. First America tried to give us uh, 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 Tiger Shock, yeah. F5G, mm -hmm. and it took almost two years of haggling and uh, pursuing these people that, okay, we need F-16 in case we had to confront uh, Russian aircraft across the border. So with a lot of reluctance they gave us F-16s, even then it was not equipped with BVR missiles, neither they gave us the BVR missiles, nor our radar was capable of uh, launching BVR missiles. So that was a very big curtailment of the capability even then. But within two years, uh, uh, Indians, they managed to buy 60 uh, Mirai 2-5 with BVR missiles. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, correspondent, I remember, asked uh, General Zia, then President of Pakistan, the question that what are your concerns on this deal? They are buying 60 Mirai 2 and that too with uh, BVR. Uh, he gave a very mature answer. Calmly, he said, uh, every independent state has a right to defend itself and they are the better judge what they need for that purpose and nobody should raise a concern on that. So we have no concern on the purchase of 60 Mirai 2-5. So same things they are doing it today. We have raised no objection to what they are buying 36 Rafael, one of the most modern and potent aircraft in the world. And in addition to that, that list is very long. Impression is generally created that they have started to distance themselves uh, from Russia and they want to come uh, towards America. I think that's not true. Wherever in the world they find any component or any weapon system which they need, they go there. From Russia, they're cooperating or they have participated in the research and development of fifth generation fighter aircraft. Indeed. Th they're technically uh, taking part in that. They are going to spend 3.7 billion in the research and manufacturing of prototype. From Russia, during this first visit, which uh, Prime Minister Modi has uh, uh, met uh, Russian President, 
uh, they are going to have 200 light uh, helicopters, uh, 60 will be manufactured in Russia and 140 in uh, India. Uh, they have 151, they have uh, uh, MI-17V-5, the latest uh, helicopter, and they are going to place another order of 51. Uh, a missile, they are spending three billion in that. They have gone to Israel. There, uh, they have bought anti-tank uh, guided missiles, 8,300, and a lot of money is being spent on that. In addition to that, they have Lightning Dash 4 pod for their uh, Su-30 and uh, Jaguar fleet. Uh, they have also bought standoff accurate uh, uh, bombs, uh, which can be utilized again fortified. Uh, underground bunkers that the command and control centers. So similarly, they have from uh, America, they have bought uh, C-17, uh, 4.5 billion they have spent. They have got latest uh, C-130J model for mm -hmm. special operations. Six they have got for 1 billion. They are placing another order for seven more. Similarly, they have signed contract for uh, Apache helicopters and Chinook helicopters. And again, they are asking another 100, I think, uh, uh, drone, armed drones. <laughs> so they have gone to France for uh, uh, this Rafale aircraft. So they are buying, they have exactly. a shopping list and a uh, very ambitious shopping list and buying anything available anywhere in the world. Their appetite is very voracious. But there is another aspect actually, uh, Marshal Shahid Latif, I wanted to draw your attention to and this is something which must have hurt you personally. I am uh, talking about the JF-17 Thunders deal which we had uh, struck with Sri Lanka, which Indians managed to uh, nearly sabotage. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, uh, let me first add uh, one figure to what uh, the Marshal uh, has counted here. Uh, the deal for Rafale is actually 126 aeroplanes. Yeah. And in the first tranche, they are going for 36. Yeah. Uh, the issue uh, is quite serious in the sense that uh, actually, uh, India's hue and cry can be understood uh, if we go back to history and uh, recall uh, their program of LCA, which they now call uh, the aircraft yeah. that they now name as Tejas. Tejas. Uh, they, at that time, were very ambitious on that program and having sunk billions of dollars in that program, uh, the aircraft has failed uh, to come up to their requirements. There were as many as 80 technical institutes that were participating in this and they had tried their best uh, that this should uh, be a fighter aeroplane that should be accepted uh, by the Indian Air Force and this should be a modern aircraft at par with the other fourth generation aeroplanes but this did not happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the JF-17 which we started much later, mm -hmm. uh, by the grace of Allah we met success uh, with that program. Um, we didn't have so many institutes working from Pakistan for that. It was, yes, uh, a participation uh, of a friendly country, China itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to go through, through this program uh, very successfully. And they were eyeing uh, the uh, regional market uh, and, uh, and they were thinking that not only will uh, this LCA meet the Indian Air Force requirement, it will also fetch them, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, get them a lot of monetary benefits mm -hmm. and they would sell it uh, in the entire region. But unfortunately, even the Indian Air Force is not happy with that aeroplane. How could they capture this market? Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened. Exactly. Having failed in that domain, they are really worried because uh, a huge uh, fleet of uh, the Indian Air Force, most of it old, uh, requiring a replacement. Uh, needing a lot of money to be spent, uh, they have ultimately gone for 126 Rafals. As far as the JF-17 is concerned, uh, you pointed out very rightly that they would try their best, uh, not only that they keep talking and keep criticizing the JF-17 in terms of its capability, but they can't do it. Uh, the JF-17 has appeared in all the leading air shows of the world. Mm -hmm. It is invited. There hasn't been even a single Chinese aeroplane, even the F-10 which the Chinese claimed to be a step ahead of the JF-17 hasn't been seen in any air shows mm -hmm. other than the local uh, air show in China. So that shows that because the JF-17 was built around international standards, it has therefore, it is capturing the international market and there is interest in that aeroplane that a lot of countries are showing. Uh, we will reach its uh, completion of its qualification soon and I'm quite hopeful that there'll be, there'll be orders placed 
uh, for this aeroplane as we have recently seen that in Qatar uh, it has performed and there is, uh, there is a, a great likelihood uh, that hopefully Qatar should buy it. And if one of such countries uh, buys this aeroplane, the others will follow suit. India, yes, has tried uh, to uh, play dirty uh, in our deal with Sri Lanka. Uh, they would always uh, try to do that. But I don't think in the long run that's going to work. If the countries have their own interests that are prime to them and they know that the GF-17 is an excellent deal, uh, there will be no uh, sanctions, embargoes when Pakistan and China are concerned. Uh, there are friendly countries in the region, they will go running for it. Uh, it is uh, relatively cheap and gives you everything that any frontline aeroplane in the world uh, has today. But the, Whether the fault they tried to find with JF-17 Thunder, which they claimed that the engine is not up to the mark. And uh, you would know better, if you recall, they even tried to put impediments when China was trying to acquire the engines from Russia. At that time, the Indians tried to make sure that uh, the deal doesn't come through, but uh, good sense prevailed. But that was long time ago. Yeah. Uh, that We have crossed that stage. No one can throw spanners into anything that is uh, on board the GF-17. We made sure even at that time when the Chinese were signing a contract with the Russians, this is Chinese responsibility, not our responsibility at all. And knowing the relationship between China and Russia, the Russians can simply not afford no, uh, to I, refuse I, anything. I wanted your opinion actually on the quality of the engine because the okay. Indians are right. trying to point out that this is not up to the uh, standards. No, the point is that it is RD-93, yeah. an improved version of what you have uh, in the MiG-29. Right. Uh, all the issues uh, that were there on this engine uh, that was put on MiG-29 were resolved before it was supplied to us. Mm -hmm. So the real story uh, is uh, being deliberately hidden. It is being painted as an engine of the MiG-29 which is not true, mm -hmm. RD-90. So therefore, in my opinion, uh, it is a propaganda. It won't work. The aircraft has performed in all the air shows and impressed people. If there was anything wrong with the engine, touch wood, so far its flight safety record is 100%. Yeah. Other than that one aircraft, which was perhaps our own mistake that we went into uh, the region mm -hmm. for which it had not been progressively cleared. I don't think even the prototype aircraft are flying, which has never been the case in the development of the most modern most scientific developments of aeroplanes, even the F-16s went through a lot of changes because it met accidents. Mm -hmm. When we were flying the F-16 Block 5 in America back in 1981, mm -hmm. we saw accidents happening in front of us and they have the best CAD CAM facilities available to them. We were not so advanced. So the proof of the pudding is in its taste. The JF-17s have an excellent flight safety record. The aircraft has performed uh, extremely well in all the air shows and has matched the performance of contemporary aeroplanes and therefore I don't think this propaganda is going to succeed because it's not uh, it is realistic. It is baseless. It is baseless. So, A. Marshal Yusuf, I mean, <laughs> what are your comments on this? Because if you recall, the Sri Lankan chief visited us. He uh, was very impressed by the aircraft and then he went back home and sent a technical team which evaluated the aircraft, which gave a green signal and to top it, Pakistan offered a line of credit to Sri Lanka and then for India to throw a spanner in the works. I think as already said by Air Marshal Shahid that Indians are always very aggressive. Uh, they may not have any logic when they want to uh, oppose something, but they just want to do for the sake of it because they are the beneficiary of that. Uh, example is uh, they are trying to throw a spanner just in the purchase of eight F-16s uh, whereas, of course, I have already uh, listed what all they are going to buy. Uh, actually, they want to maintain hegemony in the region mm -hmm. and they don't want anyone to challenge. I think instead of they uh, making hue and cry, it should be now Pakistan and even China who got to make hue and cry on the designs of India. I remember in 1998, uh, uh, they raised their defense budget by 27% that increase itself was more than the total defense budget of Pakistan. And I recall I was doing NDU then, and uh, the uh, Indian ambassador came to NDU to deliver a talk. Uh, somebody asked him a question that on one hand you are talking of peace, on the other hand uh, you have raised your budget uh, by 27%. 
so unlike a diplomat, he was very candid, very straight. He said, gentlemen, let me be very clear. Our economy has started to do well. Uh, we will give uh, to the defense water we can afford. You know, we can afford now 27% increase. And uh, we want to give uh, our armed forces whatever they want. We want to make them so strong that you don't have the courage to challenge our hegemony in the region, quote-unquote. <laughs> uh, very strong words he used. And uh, that's what they're doing. Even in uh, 2008 and 2009, and they've raised their defense budget by 33%, which is, again, almost it was double. That increase was double the total defense budget of Pakistan. So there's just no comparison with us. Uh, but still, they try to play foul as uh, this example is being given. Exactly. It won't matter to them in case we sell a couple of uh, JF-17 to uh, Sri Lanka, but they can't help it. Their nature is such. Anyway, let's move ahead. Uh, one question that arises in the minds of laymen that uh, they ask, why are we persisting with F-16s? Perhaps people are under the misnomer that these are the F-16s of the 83 vintage, but uh, perhaps you can shed some light on it. Yeah. I think it is misunderstood. Uh, the F-16s are still relevant and I think it is one of the most successful aeroplanes that was ever produced. Mm -hmm. A technology of the 70s and still uh, fighting uh, in the race uh, for any frontline aircraft anywhere in the world. Uh, the reason is that uh, they adopted a block building approach and the same thing has been done in the JF-17. Uh, uh, block uh, 5, block uh, 15, block uh, 25, block uh, uh, 52, uh, and uh, this is how the F-16 was designed. Whatever they had available at the time of its development uh, was integrated into this, but they did not wait for the technology to advance, because if you did that, uh, you will never be able to uh, freeze the design of an aeroplane mm -hmm. if you keep waiting for technology. Uh, this was something that we followed on the JF-17, precisely the same approach. And uh, I still recall uh, making uh, my presentation as the chief project director uh, in the air board and uh, with the staff. Uh, our initial plan was that uh, only the structure, airframe of uh, this aeroplane will be Chinese and weapons and avionics will be Western. Mm -hmm. But when we came to that point, we had to delink uh, that aspect. If we didn't, then waiting uh, for uh, clearances from the West and waiting for those weapons, etc., and the avionics, uh, uh, we would have uh, simply halted the program. We didn't do it. So we adopted the same approach that whatever was available from China, we put it into that aeroplane. And that, in my opinion, was such a wise decision that the program moved at a lightning speed. And that is how, from the time we started, in two and a half years, we were able to fly the prototype. And we also uh, kept uh, the provision uh, for any upgrades in the sense that whatever was available subsequently in terms of technology, uh, we will be able to upgrade this aeroplane. Its architecture was universal. There are two buses that count on an mm -hmm. aeroplane. One is 1553 and the other is 1760. One is an avionics bus and the other is a weapons bus. Mm -hmm. if, you, uh, if you build an aircraft uh, on this architecture, then anything that you can pick up from anywhere in the world, you are not limited only uh, to the American equipment or to the Western equipment. It could be any other country. All you've got to do is just bring it. We have the avionics lab, put it there, integrate it, and it will start communicating with the rest of the equipment. This was the approach that we followed. So like the F-16, which is relevant even today, the JF-17 will also remain relevant. We, have, we are now into block two. And hopefully after block two, we will enter the block three configuration. Right. And that will therefore absorb the new technologies and anything that is available in the world and anything that we need to replace because there is a universal architecture, we would not have to uh, work very hard exactly. in, in, in absorbing uh, that. But, but coming back to the F-16, the Air Marshal Shahid, perhaps you could shed some light for the sake of our viewers what is the difference between the initial Block 5s, A and C, B models which you flew to the Block 52 F-16s which uh, we are now operating? To begin with, the Block 52, uh, if you look at the airframe, it has been changed. Yes. Uh, there are those uh, fuel tanks uh, that have been 
uh, enlarged. Mm -hmm. uh, so the airframe of the Block 52 mm -hmm. is different from the older models, which mm -hmm. is A and B. Secondly, like I said, uh, over a period of time, uh, you've gone for better avionics. Uh, you count anything in the avionics, the capability has improved compared to A and B. Uh, thirdly, uh, its ranges, etc., have obviously because of the fuel mm -hmm. uh, improved. Mm -hmm. The weaponry, it is it, it now allows you to carry the weapons uh, which are the latest on the American inventory. That those are the reasons that the aircraft has become more potent. After all, if you had to compare it with the latest generation aircraft, and you still wanted it to uh, run uh, for the competition against. Uh, the high-tech aeroplanes, uh, contemporary aeroplanes, you had to keep improving it. And that is what the Americans have done. Otherwise, this wouldn't find customers. Uh, we bought it, uh, like I'm saying, just about seven, eight years ago. And uh, it was uh, in the competition. Even when Indians were trying to uh, finalize their deal, mm -hmm. they were looking at the Russians, they were looking at uh, the European aeroplanes, and they were also looking at the F-16s. Mm -hmm. So the point is that uh, you can't force customers to uh, buy this aeroplane uh, if it is not able to deliver according Obviously. to the modern times. So those are some of the capabilities I've shown you. Across the board, uh, everything has been improved over a period of time and today it matches any capability uh, of a contemporary aeroplane uh, in that bracket. True. So, uh, Air Marshal Yusuf, uh, what is the efficacy of the F-16 Block 52 in our war against terror? because uh, I'm told that it has brought us a lot of success as a platform for delivering uh, precision-guided munitions. Yes, first of all, as you said, uh, I would go back that uh, initial F-16, which we bought, uh, F-16 A and B, and even after midlife upgrade, uh, this is entirely a different aeroplane, much more capable than what initial model was. And F-16 C and D is far speeder than F-16 A and B, and the differences mainly, uh, including EW pod, uh, have been highlighted already by Marshal Shahid. And uh, why it is so important for us is there is yet another reason that because of economic conditions, we are not in a position to buy a capable aircraft of this category or better uh, from the market. India can do that. They can go for our fare because they have a better economy. We can't do that. So for the time being, F-16 C and D is the only aircraft, the best aircraft which we can afford in certain number. So this is very important aircraft for us. Uh, it will remain cutting edge of Pakistan Air Force for many years to come. And as you said, uh, the, its role, uh, it, it is uh, mainly responsible for the achievements which we have made in our uh, fight against terrorism till today. Uh, it has very precise uh, air to ground capability. Uh, it has very good recce pod uh, to find the locations uh, of uh, uh, the terrorists. And it was only and only because of this aircraft that in a rugged terrain like uh, North Waziristan and South Waziristan that we have been able to destroy uh, their hideouts, their ammo dumps and uh, their uh, command and control centers. Uh, without that, success was just not possible. And that's the reason that uh, they are being generous and they are giving us uh, eight more and contributing almost 60 percent to that. Obviously, and that is the rational A, but Air Marshal Shahid, uh, let's talk about the force goals of Pakistan Air Force. You see, you are, both of you are aware that uh, our F-7s are aging, our Mirages are aging, and we'll probably have to retire them pretty soon. So we'll be left with only the F-16s and the JF-17 Thunder. You think this is a good mix and uh, we should persist with that? Uh, how would you uh, inform our viewers about this? Yes, we have been very clear uh, about our uh, force goal plans and uh, we knew that these uh, old vintage aeroplanes will be retiring, even their retiring periods were known. Mm -hmm. They were calculated by us and we had come to a point and that was the reason uh, that, uh, that we were forced uh, to adopt this approach of making, a, uh, of, of making an indigenous aeroplane so that uh, in future we didn't have to remain dependent uh, uh, on the outside authorities. Uh, you remember what happened in the 90s. Exactly, uh, the Pressler Amendment, and, so Amendment and how we suffered and how uh, our overall flying effort reduced uh, to levels uh, which were rather dangerous. 
and uh, I think our leadership at that time took a very good decision. And uh, uh, then uh, when we talked to the Chinese, uh, they were willing to accept uh, this challenge and they were willing to support us. Our own involvement uh, played a very vital role in the sense that uh, we had wartime experiences which uh, the Chinese didn't have. Uh, we were quite conversant with the Western technology, American technology, and those were the contributions that we made in the designing of this aeroplane. Uh, initially, this aeroplane was called Super 7, and we had simply visualized that uh, we will have a Super F7 aeroplane and improve its uh, capability slightly. But when we went into calculations, we realized that it will not be cost effective. And the capability jump that it will give uh, to you uh, will hardly be meaningful. And that was the reason that as we uh, embarked upon this program, we immediately changed our mind. And we said that we should have something uh, which should be, uh, which should be uh, at bay with the contemporary aeroplanes when this aeroplane is ready. And that is why uh, the GF-17 uh, was improved even as we were uh, getting into the development phase of the JF-17. Uh, so the entire Air Force, it is planned. Uh, as and when its old aircraft retire, will continue to be replaced by the JF-17. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the rate of production is not so good uh, that we can continue to retire all aeroplanes as their lives end. So far, we have extended lives of virtually all old aeroplanes, whether it was Mirages, it was F-7s, it was A-5s, it was F-6s, all of them. Uh, hopefully, as we gear up uh, to uh, improve our uh, production, production on the JF-17, uh, I think we should come to uh, a happy situation in which uh, and JF-17 will be the backbone of Pakistan Air Force. It's a good mix. We have flown F-16 for so long. Uh, the JF-17 uh, will become your backbone and in addition to this, uh, the next generation aircraft which the Chinese uh, have, have made one which, is, which should be the, uh, the equivalent of JSF-35 or for that matter uh, F-22 Raptor and the Russians are also uh, into, that, mm -hmm. uh, into that domain. I think we should start looking at that and uh, a mix of uh, the JF-17, uh, the F-16s, Cs and Ds and the upgraded uh, fleet and the next generation aircraft, I think, uh, will, uh, will make the Air Force quite potent and uh, hopefully we should be able to defend our positions regardless of what the Indians do. As far as we are concerned, we have never harbored any offensive designs, whether it was a nuclear program or uh, it was the offensive weapons. Uh, the whole world knows that our strategy has always been defensive or at best counter-offensive. So while remaining uh, within the ambit of that strategy, uh, we will continue to have weapon systems to be able to support our strategy and, and, uh, uh, and hopefully uh, this is the plan that I have shared with you and, and it should work out uh, as the time passes. Inshallah. So what are your thoughts, say, Marshal Yusuf, on the four goals of Pakistan Air Force? I think first of all, as people understand and already stated that uh, we don't have a very ambitious plan. Uh, our main uh, aim has been just to defend ourselves. We don't have any aggressive designs against anybody. And we are not in competition with India because India has certain other designs. India is planning to have by 2022 uh, 482 high-tech aircraft. And finally, they are, they are planning to have an air force of 880 aircraft, which is a very... Uh, very ambitious. Very, very <laughs> ambitious plan. And they have planned to s spend... 100 billion in the next 10 years for the modernization of their defense forces. Mm -hmm. We don't have the money, we don't have the resources. And, and we, we don't, don't have, have the aims We also. don't have any aim of that nature. Uh, therefore, uh, therefore, our goals are very, very limited, uh, defensive in nature. And for that, we are looking uh, for an air force of about 350, 380 aircraft. And uh, for the time being, it would be a combination of F-16s and the F-17 has already said by Marshal Shahid that Mirages and, and F-7s would be replaced by the F-17. However, uh, F-16s ought to retire one day. Already studies uh, are in hand and that with which aircraft they are going to be retired. Uh, it was a very good decision as said already uh, by the commanders of Pakistan Air Force that we decided to make the F-17. Thanks to Americans 
had they not put restriction on us in <laughs> 1980s and 90s, we probably might not have gone for JF-17. It was those uh, restrictions that we decided to have an aeroplane which would be free of these sanctions. And we ended up making a beautiful aircraft that is JF-17. Uh, but of course, plans are already there. Uh, but for the time being, for a few years to come, I think combination is going to be F-16s and F-17. Indeed. But uh, uh, M. Ashil Shahid, maybe you could shed some light on the training of our Pakistan Air Force. You remember when you were flying, and both of you are veterans also of the war against uh, the Soviet forces in the late 70s and uh, early 80s. But now the adversary, I mean the current war which Pakistan Air Force is engaged in, the war against terror, it's quite different. So how do you think our air crew has adapted to this new challenge? I think our air crew uh, have already uh, <clears throat> shown uh, through their performance that uh, they have successfully uh, not only uh, gained experience uh, uh, on this war on terror, uh, but they have trained uh, very well and very hard uh, to fight this menace. Uh, the results are obvious. You see, uh, in, the, in the entire world, it is the air power that plays uh, now a decisive role in any combat. This is true. Whether it was Gulf War, uh, Chechnya, uh, Afghanistan, Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo, wherever. And it is the Americans who mm -hmm. are the trend setters and, and they had set up this trend. Therefore, per force, uh, the Air Force has to train hard. While it has to defend its own position, it has to provide cover both to the land forces and to the naval forces. Now, this is a job uh, that, has to be, uh, that has to be performed equally well. Uh, however, uh, the Air Force is used to soften uh, targets. And uh, if, you, if you look back and uh, see how Iraq was demolished and uh, uh, destabilized and decimated, uh, before even the ground forces walked in. Mm -hmm. So the role of the ground forces these days is that of occupation. And it is the air force or the air power uh, that uh, takes the initial brunt. And if you have a strong air power, uh, the job of the other two forces becomes easier. So therefore, our, uh, our pilots, uh, having felt the need that, that this is a war that we'll have to fight for a long time, uh, have been trained. Uh, like I said, uh, it is the results that prove how well have they performed. Uh, although it is not uh, publicized much, but behind every operation, it is the Air Force that lays the foundation of a successful operation. Uh, and uh, the aircraft that we are using uh, give you sufficient uh, capability to be able to meet that objective and to be able to fulfill that aim. Whether it was anything in Blochistan, or anything in Fata, in the North Waziristan area, the Air Force has led the operations. And uh, they have delivered those results, created grounds for our uh, ground forces to come in. And that is where I think the success of the overall operation uh, has been uh, noticeable. Indeed. So what are your thoughts uh, on the uh, war on terror operations which air power has been able to achieve as far as Pakistan Air Force is concerned? I think uh, just uh, first going back to the first question that was related to training, uh, in case we look back in our history, there were two very distinctive advantage, advantages which Pakistan Air Force had over its adversaries, maybe it's 65 war or maybe 1971 war. One was dynamic leadership. We have been very, very stringent when we want to make the leader leadership mean starting from squadron commander onwards. There are some very good professionals who could not excel in the career because they did not have those leadership qualities in them and they had to, of course, fade away. Similarly, we have been very, very careful when it came to uh, quality of uh, the manpower and especially quality of pilots. Uh, we have had generally very high attrition rate because our standards were very high. And uh, I remember on F-16s, my Shahid would uh, uh, support me that when uh, we started to suspend people who came to F-16s and uh, people started to say they need astronauts, they don't need pilots because <laughs> standards are so high. So that's the standard and that's the reason that very quickly our people have adopted to the uh, requirements of anti-terrorism uh, campaign and today we are probably the only Air Force in the world which has 
uh, the experience of and extensive experience of uh, this campaign. Indeed, and it's very heartening. So, viewers, with that, we uh, wrap up this discussion. It has been uh, very heartening to listen to two veterans, two stalwarts who have in their own times been outstanding fighter pilots, but more importantly, they told us about the efficacy of the eight F-16s Block 52, which we are likely to acquire from the United States Air Force. What is the pressing need for it? They also talked uh, talked about uh, the Indian halabalu, which uh, they have said that it is baseless. But more importantly, they have highlighted that the war on terror is being won because the air power is giving its optimum. Our pilots, our ground crew and our air crew have not only managed to take on, take on this challenge and get catch the bull by its horns, but they have been able to turn around this particular enemy which was faceless, which was hiding and slithering away in the darkness because the F-16s and the other platforms which we have, which allow us to see through in all weather at all hours and that is how Pakistan is going to gain. Let us not count numbers, let us count quality because Pakistan Air Force which has been at the cutting edge of the forces is likely to give its best because it does not harbor any adverse feelings against any other country but it is training hard to meet all the challenges to defend not only the aerial fronters, frontiers but support the armed forces of Pakistan and the people of Pakistan. Pakistan Air Force may live on. I'd like to thank you Air Marshal. Shahid Latif, I'd like to thank you, Air Marshal Yusuf Chaudhary. It was a pleasure listening to both of you. Just keep watching us. Hope to see you in the next program, inshallah. Allah Hafiz.